I have always been enchanted by stories of our oceans, great tales of exploration, and an ocean thriving with life. I imagined, what would I have seen if I had dived on these sites just 10, 20, or 50 years earlier? Would I have seen sharks here? Would the ocean floor have been lined with beautiful corals and tornadoes of jacks? For years, we have been sold a story about beauty below the waves. But unfortunately, like most stories we've been told, they were never ours. They belong to a different generation, my father's generation. And unless we act now, they will remain just stories. I grew up by the ocean, captivated by the waves and the mysteries that lay beneath them. It was here that my fascination with marine life began, rock pooling with my dad on my local beach. It felt like my own personal barrier reef as I explored the pools and discovered the mesmerizing creatures within them. As an avid diver and underwater photographer, my dad would fill my head with stories from his journeys. Schools of fish so large they blocked out the sun, sharks circling him and bumping into his camera before disappearing back into the blue with a flick of their fin. These images fueled my ambition to become a marine biologist, and as I dedicated myself to a life in the ocean, I soon came to realize the simple truth. My ocean is not my father's ocean. As humanity has progressed and developed, our oceans have fallen away. I have watched as the health has declined, and I have been left wondering whether our ocean's fate is written. I want to find out if there are still places that are wild and pristine, and what of my ocean can still be saved. My journey starts somewhere close to my heart. Jamaica, the island my family once called home. To explore the reefs I've heard so many stories about, my father saw, still here? The postcard reef my dad told me stories about is gone. What has happened here? How has it all gone so wrong? To fix the problems beneath the waves, we must first turn our attention to what is happening above the surface. Like many threats facing our oceans, I fear we may be to blame. Like many islands in the Caribbean, Jamaica utilizes the sea as a source of food and income. But the impact of local fishing pressures, combined with industrial fishing, coastal development and ocean acidification, has led to a decline in the health of the reefs here. And well, that's all coral. Yeah. That's some of the broken coral down there. Fishermen now have to travel further out to sea to catch smaller fish. Longer hours, more fuel for smaller rewards. Diving on these reefs it's clear there are very few big fish left. Problem, the knife to stick them when they get you. They are bad fish, you know. Yeah, you yeah. see up in the water, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah barracuda. barracuda. Dangerous fish. And apex predators like sharks are nowhere to be seen. If fish numbers are ever to return here, fishing practices need to be regulated to give this delicate ecosystem time to recover. Our oceans are vast, but not vast enough. Jamaica's reefs are not alone in their struggle for survival. Reefs globally now face enormous pressures. In a world that is so dominated by climate change, pollution and overfishing, how can a small island like Jamaica hold on to its reefs? Though oceans apart, the 
the islands of Yap and Palau are faced with similar challenges. I was five years old when I first visited these islands with my family. Snorkeling along these reefs, I saw my first shark and knew I was hooked. The greyish tones and muted greens from my local beach, here, were in vibrant technicolour and bursting with life. With childish wonder, I imagined that they would exist like this forever. But in a world where so much damage has been done to our oceans already, how could they? Like Jamaica, these small islands are reliant on their oceans. But through cultural teachings, passed from one generation to the next, they have regulated fishing pressures for hundreds of years. I want to know if this is still the case, and if there's a chance to learn from this community. Yap, amongst the, the islands, still uh, retain or contain some of the old traditional ways of living. That's why we have the Council of Chiefs of Yap is still pushing forward to, to maintain the culture because in, in, in many ways it's very rare, it's very important, it's, it's good for the people. It's influenced with uh, modern luxury, modern, modern living, things like this. Yeah, so there's a major change. I haven't been here in 20 years, and I fear that my childhood experiences may just be a distant memory. As times have changed, this pocket of resilience may too have fallen victim to global pressures. Taking my first breaths beneath these waters, I'm relieved to see it as exactly how I remember. A hidden treasure in the Pacific Ocean. It's not perfect. Warming seas have taken their toll but it's vibrant and healthy, almost the postcard reef from my father's stories. Here, I can see marine life the way I had always imagined. Schools of jacks so big they block out the sun, and barracudas seen in the hundreds rather than tens. The rare bump head that usually acts as the highlight on a dive, they can be seen schooling in thousands. have to understand that Yap is a very small island in the Pacific. Our food is from the ocean. We have medicine from the ocean. We don't have to change them. We have to live with, with the nature to keep it. Yap and Palau were the first countries to create sanctuaries that protected wonderful animals like sharks and mantas. And their local understanding of fish spawning activities and life cycles has allowed them to regulate fishing practices in a way that will preserve these waters for generations to come. Here, I can see sharks in abundance, hunting and hanging in the upwelling currents. These marine protected areas act like windows in time. They allow us to step back into the days when sharks were still the ruling apex predators in our oceans, and we were just visitors. As I dive, surrounded by the marvel that first inspired me on this journey, I can't help but wonder what the fate of our oceans will be. Is there really a chance for recovery on our worst affected reefs? Or will seascapes like this remain treasures that only a few can witness in the furthest corners of our planet? In Jamaica, where I had seen only a desolate and dead reef, there's now a chance of it coming back to life. Here at the Alligator Head Foundation, they have begun to turn things around, and I want to meet the people who have assisted in making this change happen. I was a fisherman. I used to do spear fishing inside of this center, you know, that is a no-take zone. But then you didn't see this much fish. But now you actually see that is actually changing. So they say they stopped fishing for 20 years just to bring back the fish population, and it did actually work. So for us, I think we just have to accept a little change and work with the flow and see where it goes. The building blocks for life are all still here. They just need a little help. Fishermen like Dwight have retrained to protect the reefs and help restore life to their local waters. 
Think of corals like the roses in your garden. Algae, other weeds, and fish are the gardeners. Coral needs sunlight to thrive. And without gardeners, algae dominates, blocking out the sun. So the reef dies. Without the fish, it is our job to step in. This passionate team work with cutting edge science in wet labs to find ways to not just monitor the health of their reefs, but plant new ones. Working in collaboration with local fishermen, they've created fish sanctuaries that will give these reefs the time they need to recover. When you break small pieces of coral off, there is a healing response in the coral that accelerates the growth. And that's how microfragmenting was kind of discovered. So we have two different types of nurseries set up in the water that are glorying staghorn coral. The idea is to take small pieces from the natural population and multiply them to then be able to rehabilitate reef areas. If you attach a number of pieces like what I've done here on the same piece of substrate, they will all grow at this accelerated rate and then they will fuse together because they're all the same genotype and create a larger coral in a shorter period of time that can then be outplanted on the reef. So you're telling me about this little coral that's just the one polyp and how you think it's happy. How can you tell if a coral is happy? Generally, when corals are happy, their tentacles are exposed. When those tentacles are exposed in the water, they're out, they're feeding. It's, it's a settled coral that's trying to absorb as much as it can. So this coral, which was cut maybe 10 days ago, and it's a single polyp, is all exposed and happy. So that shows that this is, this is viable. One polyp is viable for a generation. This is staghorn coral, an endangered species that used to be prevalent on these coasts. Their branch-like structures dissipate wave energy and create unique habitats for marine life. I want to see colors. I want to see more coral than algae. I want to see all 26 species of Atlantic corals somewhere out there on that reef. For me, fish are the extra. The corals create that movie scene. By returning these essential habitats and storm barriers to the coast of Jamaica and regulating fishing pressures, the Alligator Head Foundation have restored hope for this small island. Healthy coral means fish build seas. In just a few years of work, fish biomass is recovered by 200%. I can only wonder what these waters will look like in another 25 years. Our reef is so rich and beautiful. I think it has the ability to bounce back faster than we think, if we just give it the time to do so. Within two years, what I have seen as a diver happening here, sometimes I don't speak about it on the road, because if you do, then you're going to be in problem with the guys again that are fishing. I just keep it to myself, to who is at the foundation here, and we just smile about what is happening but the fishes are coming back. <laughs> we are at a tipping point. It is our actions in the next 10 years that will define the future of our oceans for centuries. I may never be able to see our reefs the way my father once did, and I can't tell his stories. Those reefs belong to the past. Now, we need to look to the future and create stories of our own. The story I hope to tell is of resilience, innovation, and passion. How my generation rebuilt our oceans. I hope that coral gardens and oceans filled with life will not be legends we pass on, but a legacy.